Hello and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. And today we're delighted to welcome back to the Westminster Institute uh, Pete Hoekstra, who last uh, graced us with a presentation in 2015. So it's overdue and we're delighted to have him here. Now, uh, Peter Hoekstra was U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands during the Trump administration, and he served 18 years in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the second district in Michigan. Uh, he served as chairman and ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee. He is currently chairman of the Center for Security Policy Board of Advisors and a distinguished fellow at the Gatestone Institute. He joins us at Westminster today to discuss Europe's energy crisis, causes, and is there a cure? Pete, welcome back. Great to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, 2015, it has been too long. <laughs> Ambassador, you were recently back in Europe, in fact, in the Netherlands, where you served so well as U.S. Ambassador. And I'm sure the energy crisis must have been one of the things at the top of the issues that you discussed. Yeah, the, uh, actually I was invited to go back to talk about the other key crisis that uh, I think we face uh, here in the West uh, that uh, freedom-loving uh, democracies uh, face, and that was China. So they invited me to come and speak about China. Uh, and I went and I fell smack dab into the, uh, a couple of other crises, uh, the, the energy crisis and also the agriculture crisis. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know, people have seen it, but there's been a, the Dutch farmers have been at the forefront of uh, the environmental movement right now. And, and the forefront in a couple of ways. I mean, the, they're the, some of the most productive farmers in the world. Uh, you know, they're the second largest agricultural exporter in the world. Mm. The U.S. is number one. But we have 340 million people. The Dutch are the second largest, and they have 17 million. That's people. astonishing. But they're under assault right now because the government wants to reduce nitrogen, uh, you know, nitrogen deposits, and so they've initially put forward a plan that will take 12 percent of their farmers and put them out of business and another 27% of their farmers and reduce their business uh, by at least 50%. And these are government estimates. These aren't, you know, political party estimates or whatever. These are official government estimates as to what these new rules and regulations uh, will bring uh, to the farmers. And so I asked to meet with some of the farmers and then when you're meeting with the farmers, uh, you also, uh, you know, you run smack dab into the energy crisis because, you know, farms use energy, agriculture uses energy. So we talked about energy and we talked about China. Well, I understand that ammonia, which is extracted from uh, gas, is essential for the production of fertilizer and the uh, tremendous uh, decline in gas imports, obviously from Russia, is creating a crisis in the fertilizer industry and, and some of it is having to shut down and that will cascade into this enormous problem for farmers. Uh, yeah, you're a little ways ahead of me, but that's exactly right. Okay. I mean, you know, because you know, right now, you know, Europe is in the midst of an energy crisis. Um, you know, and the, you know, the job of government, uh, and we, I dealt with the Dutch government and my colleagues well, dealt with the rest of the, the European countries talking about energy. Uh, and we said, you know, you need to develop uh, sustainable energy sources, you need to have a secure network, uh, you need to have sufficient quantities, and they need to be affordable. These are kind of the principles that we took to our European colleagues and, you know, because what were they doing? Uh, they were getting, you know, Germany was closing its nuke plants. Everybody was closing their coal plants, uh, you know, and they, so they were getting rid of baseload energy, uh, and they really didn't have a plan that was sustainable and affordable and secure 
moving forward, at least from our perspective. You know, the, uh, there was a lot of focus on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, and we said, you know, is it really, you know, is it really good policy for Western Europe, uh, our allies, to become dependent on Russian natural gas? Is it going to be secure? Is it going to be affordable? And I still remember going and dealing with the, with the Dutch media primarily. And this was off, you know, there, there's two things that we would go talk to them a lot about. Uh, we talked to them about paying for NATO, 2%. And we talked to them about Nord Stream 2. Because in my case, the Dutch, being a wealthy country, they were financing it, a good portion of it. And also by being, you know, great technology, having great technology for water, they were helping build it. So we, we would talk to the media and they'd say, and, you know, they'd say, Pete, 2% for NATO, why do we need to pay? Do you really, <laughs> you crazy Americans, you and Trump, you believe Putin's going to come across the border in his tanks and then they'd laugh. And we would just say, well, you know. Surprise. If, if, if they do, we ought to be ready. You know, and well, I mean, you would think it, it, it certainly was consistent U.S. policy uh, going back to President Reagan to discourage the Europeans from making themselves dependent upon Russian gas. And of course, during the Cold War, uh, the reason for that was pretty evident, uh, though the Europeans still wanted to do it, uh, thanks to some of the European leaders uh, in office at that time. It, it didn't get as bad as it otherwise would have. So one can understand at the end of the Cold War, what's the problem? And, and therefore, since uh, gas burns cleaner than other forms of uh, energy, they, they thought get what getting more of that would make it easier for them to go green. So from what I understand, and you can correct me, Germany became, uh, got 50% of its uh, gas from Russia and Europe overall 40%, is that? Yeah, that's about right. The... Yeah. And, you know, you know mm -hmm. the, and when, again, when you would point that out and you say, is this, and, you know, with Nord Stream 2, those numbers would have gone higher, right? And so you'd say, is, is this really a good strategy to become more dependent on Russia? And they would laugh again and they'd say, Pete, what do you think the Russians are going to do? They need our money. You think they're going to turn off the uh, the spigot, you know? And because and Al, you're just saying this because you want them to buy U.S. gas, and you say, no, actually, we recognize gas is a, you know, is an international commodity. There's world prices, and but yeah, we would encourage you to build LNG plants uh, and port facilities so that you know you could compare the price and the quantity coming from Russia uh, and compare it with it coming from the U.S. or coming from the Middle East so that you'd have alternatives that if, you know, Russian gas was turned off or American gas became too expensive, you could just tell the Americans, sorry, we're not buying your gas. You know, we're going to Russia because it's secure and it's affordable. Well, what we've recently found out is it's neither. It's, uh, you know, the Gazprom uh, has cut off their energy, uh, their natural gas to the French. Uh, Nord Stream, the Nord Stream pipeline uh, or the pipelines coming into Germany uh, have been shut down for maintenance reasons. Uh, and in the last couple of days, we've now also seen uh, that the pipeline, because the other place that Europe gets natural gas from is they get it from Norway. Uh, and so the Nord Stream pipeline coming from Norway going into Germany is now suffering technical difficulties uh, as uh, the people in Denmark have described it because it goes through some of Denmark's, uh, you know, part of their country uh, underwater. Uh, it's damaged. It's not working the way that it should. Uh, and they're not ruling out that it was sabotaged. And so here, all of a sudden, Europe is now in the energy crisis. So how does this play out, you know, in, in the Netherlands when I'm there? So we had, I had lunch with some of my staff that worked for me uh, there. They're having, they're seeing their energy cost to, for electricity and heating their homes 
going as high as 600 euros per month. So in with the exchange, that's $600 a month just for electricity and gas. Uh, significantly higher than where they were before. They're worried about uh, shortages, that this winter, if it's a cold winter, it's not going to be how much you're paying. It's going to be whether there's actually enough. Uh, and then you go is what you were talking about. Uh, I've got uh, a colleague that's been doing a lot of work in Germany in BASF, lots of fertilizer plants. And I don't know if they have 27 in Europe or 27 in Germany, but to efficiently run a fertilizer plant, you need to be able to get at least a 50 percent of the natural gas that you need to operate the plant. You know, if you get below 50, you just can't operate it anymore. If you're between 50 and 100, optimal, you know, uh, you're fine. But they're getting to the point now for a, where a number of their fertilizer plants uh, can't get enough feed stock. Uh, and they're on the verge of shutting down. And that creates two problems. Creates a problem because people are put out of work, uh, but it's also going to create a problem because you're going to see a shortage of fertilizer uh, in Europe, maybe the world. And that means that there's going to be less food production. So it's a cascading problem when governments put themselves into a position where they are this vulnerable to outside pressures for a key component of what a country and an economy needs to operate effectively. And having made themselves all the more vulnerable <clears throat> by shutting down coal plants, shutting down nuclear power plants, especially as, as Germany has done, what, what was the motivation for doing that? I mean, you can understand the coal plants as, as a big polluter, but nuclear plants don't pollute. Germany, uh, Merkel made the decision on nukes uh, based on Fukushima. When they had the, uh, you know, the disaster in Japan, uh, Merkel in Germany, rather than you know, saying, okay, let's take a look at it, exactly what the problems were in Japan, see if we face some of the same threats or some of the same concerns in, here in Europe, uh, and then let's, you know, let's address those, uh, basically said, nukes are bad. We're going to close them. And so it was all based on uh, what happened in Japan, a one-off. A one-off in which no one was killed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was a huge earth earthquake and great right, yeah, yeah, a huge disaster. disaster. But uh, And what they did is, you know, and this is where you know, they made the decision to close them and they didn't put in, ter in place an, a reliable alternative plan that said, okay, we're taking this all off a line. Oh, wait a minute, this is X percentage of our production of, of, uh, of energy, of electricity. Uh, how are we going to make that up? You can't make it up with solar. Uh, you can't make it up with wind. We don't have the battery technology storage uh, capacity right now, our capability to, you know, when it runs, you build up the batteries and when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you can go back to the batteries. That technology doesn't exist. So, you know, I've described that they built an energy strategy based on hope that, the, you know, the sun would shine and the wind would blow at the, exactly the right time. So any disrupt, there wouldn't be any disruption because they were right at that margin. Uh, we're, we're producing enough, but if there's any kind of disruption, uh, whoa, and they not only found a little disruption, uh, what they found with Russia, they now found a significant disruption. Well, France, as you know, never suffered from a, a phobia with nuclear power, right. and uh, some 70% of its energy is produced by nuclear power plants. However, currently they're only running at 50% capacity. Uh, pipe corrosion, maintenance, uh, inspections, um, uh, labor problems. And apparently an another thing, I don't know whether this is an issue in the Netherlands, is the drought in Europe is so severe that some of the river water that's used to cool plants, yeah, there, there isn't simply enough of it. And it's dangerous to run the plants without the, the cooling and they have to shut them down. Yeah, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, again, this is 
a lack of foresight by their political leaders in that, number one, you know, you, what you would do is you would think you would space out your maintenance. Okay, every year we're going to do, you know, we're, we're going to take 10% of the power offline and, you know, over, over a 10-year cycle or an 8-year cycle, whatever the experts tell you, uh, you know, we will replenish it on, or we will refurbish it on, on this schedule. So we'll never have to take a big part down, but to take 50% down of your 70% at one time, you know, you're exactly right. Uh, and no, the Dutch have had a, uh, the Dutch also have, have had a drought uh, issue. It hasn't affected, uh, I think they've only got one nuke plant uh, that they're operating. So it hasn't affected their ability uh, to operate their, their nuclear uh, plant, uh, but it's had another, you know, it's, it's had other impacts uh, in the country. I, I was uh, following a story in France of the largest glass producer in Europe, or perhaps the world, uh, that has to keep its uh, furnaces that, that melt the sand on all the time. If you turn them off, the furnace is ruined. Uh, I mean, they can, over a period of a month, kind of uh, slow it down, cool it off, turn it off, and, and pull maintenance. But um, if if the energy supply isn't there to keep those furnaces going, that this huge employer in this certain part of France uh, goes under, it'll be an economic catastrophe for the area because it's it's not simply the glass they produce. Uh, they're the cardboard box makers and, and people who make the the packaging to put the glasses, et cetera, et cetera. So it, there's a cascading effect there. Apparently, a Russian government spokesman said, speaking of their maintenance problems with Nord Stream 1, right? Yeah. That, uh, that somehow those problems would go away if uh, Europe would lift the sanctions against Russia. Yeah. So it's a political move uh, by Russia's part. And as you pointed out, the Russians, uh, the, the Europeans made themselves susceptible to this. Yeah, these are all self-inflicted wounds. Tanks don't have to roll. You could just have your energy cut off and your, your societies can go into crisis. And which is exactly what's happening in Europe. You know, you talk about, the, you've, talk, you've brought up fertilizer, you've brought up the glass manufacturer in the Netherlands, one of their largest mm -hmm. exports. Uh, one of their largest agricultural exports, exports is not necessarily food that we eat, it's flowers, right? The Dutch are known for their flowers. Um, I was at a flower grower and, and you're, you know, he was saying, Pete, right now I'm, I'm fine, okay? I got greenhouses, it's, it's warm, the temperatures are fine, I'm not using much energy, uh, so we're okay. He says, but his energy costs had, had increased eightfold and it's a big component of, of his operation and he's saying this winter I, re I really should just shut down but he says I can't because if I shut down you know my whole supply chain is disrupted he says I'm, I'm the beginning of the supply chain but if, if the farmers in the Netherlands shut down he says you know then the, uh, it has an impact on you know, the, the whole chain of supply that gets the flour from the Netherlands to, you know, the, uh, to a store here in the U.S. And he says, so if I, if I shut down and we don't grow, then the flour auction shuts down. And then KLM, you know, the holds in the KLM planes, people think KLM flies uh, people, right? But what really propelled a lot of their growth is that they transported flowers around the world in their cargo hold. This is why the auctions in the Netherlands, maybe for multiple reasons, but one of the reasons, uh, they're so early in the morning. You want to go to a flower auction? It's exciting. It's fun to watch. But you got to go at 4.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, because, you know, I think by 7 o'clock at the latest, they're done and the auction halls are relatively close to skip hall and the trucks are taking all these flowers to skip hall and get them on to get them on uh klm airplanes and uh, but you know so this farmer says i gotta keep growing he said i don't think i'm gonna make any money uh his i think he was selling a stem a chrysanthemum stem he says you know 
my, my price right now is 25 cents. He says, but this winter, I'm, I'm going to need to get at least a buck fifty. Mm-hmm. He says, I'm not sure that, the, you know, and that, that's what he's getting. And then you get all the different markups. And he says, I'm not sure there's going to be any customers, but I got to keep growing. <clears throat> and if I have to take a lower price or whatever, I'm going to lose money, but I got to keep the supply network in place. That's, that's what happens when, you know, a key part of your economy, uh, you know, goes, to, goes, goes in the tank. I understand that problem is affecting as well uh, greenhouses, hothouses that grow vegetables sure. and tomatoes through the winter uh, that they won't be able to stay open either <clears throat> Yeah. if the energy problem gets worse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and Europe has promised to stop importing Russian oil by the end of December, correct? <laughs> they've promised lots of things, but yeah, no, you're right. Well, but I mean, currently, yeah, right, no, you're right. But, then, but currently, they're still importing, and but they're saying at the end of December, at the end of the year, uh, no more Russian imports of oil and gas. Yes, and they they do generate a good deal of their energy from oil. Yeah. So, uh, well, the uh, so that's going to raise prices. Oh yeah, I'm, yeah. There's. I mean, it's you. You wonder what the breaking point is here. I know that recently, seventy thousand people were in the streets of Prague, demonstrating uh, against these energy prices, <clears throat> and pretty much saying, "The Czech Republic first. You know, we're, we're you take care of us. This Ukraine thing is." Uh, damaging us all, and of course, I, uh, I presume that's why Russia is is using this as a lever to break the the European coalition against yeah. Russia in support of Ukraine. Yeah, and I think you know, um, it's not hard to imagine that happening in other parts of Europe. I mean, the Dutch recognize uh, the the population. I think recognizes how they got into this problem, and it's the problem the. The decisions that their policymakers made, you know, to get out of coal, uh, to do a, make a whole, to become dependent on Russia, uh, you know, one of the newspapers uh, that was very critical of of, the, of President Trump and myself for, you know, bringing up these issues uh, while I was there, uh, in in recent months wrote an op-ed and said, you know, you know, Hookstra and Trump might have been right. You know, becoming dependent on Russian gas may have been a bad idea, and uh, yeah, because they're so you know their their public sees it. So I don't know whether the Dutch will protest. The farmers have protested, uh, you know, uh, what uh, the government wants to do to them, and so. Um, but exactly, it's a tactic of the Russians <clears throat> to break the solidarity um, and the consensus to of of Europe to confront. Uh, Russia because of its invasion of Ukraine. And it's not hard for me to imagine that, you know, especially if they run in, price is one thing. You can manage price in the short term, which the governments in Europe are doing. I don't, I think it's, it's, it's a bad way to manage it. What they're going to do is they're going to provide subsidies. They're going to cap the cost that energy companies can charge, which means, you know, energy companies will produce less energy. Um, and then what they're going to do is they're going to subsidize their citizens, send them a check to cover some of these increases. Well, that's only sustainable for a, a limited period of time. What they need to do is they need to get fully involved in, an, uh, uh, in a rapid process to increase the supply of energy, which right now they're not doing. But for those reasons, it, it's not hard for me to imagine uh, especially France and Germany, going to Zelensky and saying, negotiate, negotiate. And Zelensky is going to have to listen because uh, you know, the key supplier, obviously, is the U.S. NATO is a hollow shell in many ways. Uh, but, you know, just the fact that France and Germany would go to Zelensky and say, negotiate, get a ceasefire, or whatever, even if you have to give up some territory, we need this energy coming in. It's, uh, it, it's tough, and Russia is using it as a leverage point. 
Now, you mentioned the approach that European governments are taking right now, uh, capping the price of energy and subsidizing the citizens. Uh, it would seem to me that that's the perfect formula for uh, to, to lead to rationing because you're increasing demand while you're diminishing supply and therefore the only way you can distribute it is through rationing. Is that, is that what will happen? Again, if there's more disruptions in terms of supply, very possible. But right now what you've already seen in the Netherlands uh, is you've seen what is called 25% demand destruction. Meaning, you know, people are looking at this. It kind of goes back to the days of Jimmy Carter where, you know, uh, we haven't reached winter yet, but where, you know, the citizens of the Netherlands are saying, I'm wearing, instead of, you know, instead of having the temperature in the house at 70, I'm going to 68 or 65 and I'm going to wear a sweater and sit under a blanket. Uh, industries are, you know, reducing uh, their use of energy, not willingly, but because they can't afford and the price of their goods are getting too high. But uh, so you'll see demand destruction. And you're ac absolutely right. If uh, you're getting into the price controls and these types of things, and I don't think it's unreasonable to see governments then starting to say, okay, X amount is going to go for consumer use, X amount is going to go for uh, industrial purposes and those types of things. It's, it's, a, it's a natural progression of where this goes. Interesting you should mention President Jimmy Carter because some energy analysts have said this is going to be as bad as the 70s uh, when the Saudis uh, rationed or, or embargoed oil right. to the United States. Other energy analysts say, no, this is going to be worse than the 1970s for Europe. Uh, and they also are saying, this is more than a one winter problem. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, it, it, it's, we, could, we could increase our production of oil and gas fairly quickly here in the U.S. Why haven't we? Well, we've got an administration that basically has declared war on, you know, fossil fuels. Okay, but you know, if if we built out the infrastructure for uh, oil and gas, uh, we're sitting on you know, you know, hundreds of years of supply of natural gas uh, at affordable prices, uh, and if we unleashed it, uh, you know, it. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a multi-year emergency. Uh, and, you know, it would be good for us. It would create jobs here in the U.S. It would create tremendous amounts of, of, of value uh, here in the United States by, you know, by exporting oil and gas. Uh, and at that point in time, you know, this is where I, you know, right now we view it as either or, right? You know, if you produce, you know, if you're producing fossil fuels, you, um, you know, then you're not green. Well, take the profits and take the investments and take the wealth that comes from uh, fossil fuels and use that to do additional research in terms of conservation and you know, all, you know, pushing green energy further along quicker. Uh, but again, don't make the same mistake that Europe did, which is cut down on fossil fuels, cut down on your base energy, and develop a strategy that is based on hope. Okay, I mean that doesn't work, and we're we're seeing it unfold right now uh, in Europe. I mean, when you know when President Biden came in and you know immediately canceled the uh, the Keystone Pipeline, and in Michigan we have a governor that wants to close the pipeline that goes under the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, it's kind of like, okay, you know, we understand what you're trying to do, but recognize what this could end up doing to consumers and to business if we don't have alternatives. And right now we don't have the alternatives. And so you already saw, you know, uh, I don't remember exactly what precipitated it, uh, but the governor in California saying, hey guys, can you charge your cars at a different, your electric cars at a different point, of, you know, a different time during the day because don't do it during the day. Uh, it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. Now that we shouldn't have to be making ra rationing that decision, especially while we are saying, while at the same time they're saying, 
you know, no more gas guzzling cars can be sold in California. And it, right now they're proving they don't have the infrastructure to even support the limited number of electric cars that they have in place today. And it doesn't look like they have a plan to put in place the, a grid system uh, that in five to 10 years is going to be able to support uh, an electric fleet that is much bigger than what uh, it is today. And there's other issues. The, the cost of, I think the price of lithium just reached record highs and we don't produce lithium. You know, that comes from China, it comes from Africa. So, and you need lithium to produce batteries. Uh, my understanding is there, you know, people are now, experts are now starting to, to write about, what are we gonna do with all these batteries that come, you know, that at the end of their shelf or at the end of their life, what are we gonna do to recycle those? Types? There's lots of issues that are coming out. And, uh, you know, Let's, let's examine all of those before we go pell-mell down this path. Well, in the larger picture, it's, it, it, it certainly seems ironic that the United States very recently was energy independent, or was a net exporter of energy, and now it's once again dependent, it's importing. And President Biden had to go meet with uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia to try to nudge him into uh, increasing Saudi oil production, which they declined to do. Yeah. So it was, it was not only was it ironic, it was humiliating. Uh, but in terms of Europe, you have countries uh, that also would have a huge amount of energy underground if they employed fracking. Right. But they were, what, why won't they do that? Well, well the UK just, Britain. yeah, the UK just announced Hey, we're fracking. We're, okay, so that turns them around. But what about the rest of Europe? I mean, they, they view, you know, the, uh, the environmental movement has effectively um, shut down fracking. Okay, and we've done it here and there have not been consequences. Now, in the Netherlands, uh, they've, they didn't do fracking. Uh, they have shut down their gas production. They produced, they were a net exporter of natural gas. Um, and they did it out of the province where I was born, the province of Groningen. Um, but the difference is in the U.S., a lot of our gas, where we frack and all of that, they're in rock formations. Sure. So when you pull the gas out, you're okay. In the Netherlands, it's more of a peat bog. It's a marsh. So what's, what happened in the province of Groningen is they're extracting all of this gas, and I think they've been doing it for... 40, 45 years, and the ground is actually settling. Mm. And so the Dutch government said, well, wait a minute, you know, there's a lot of people that live in Groningen, uh, and the ground is settling. And so they, they have stopped significantly, probably 80, maybe 90% of their gas extraction in the province of Groningen. Um, but in other parts of Europe, I think fracking is a viable alternative. But right now it's, 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 not under consideration as it has been in, no. in uh, the Great Britain. Though, as you know, there's a, going to be a change in government in Italy, and I don't know whether that's a, whether they have that potential in the first place right. and whether they would do it in the second. Well, what, from everything you've said, it certainly seems that Russia is in the driver's seat right now. No, right, in the, for the short term. Yeah, for the short term. Yes. What do you assess as the long-term costs for Russia from doing this? I would like to think that the long-term cost to Russia is that they will become and will continue to be a supplier of fossil fuels to, to Europe but they will not be the dominant supplier. That, you know, the end result will be going, yeah, they, let's be honest, they were the preferred supplier, okay, for Germany and, it's, you know, Russia was the preferred supplier. In the Netherlands, I wouldn't necessarily say they were the preferred supplier, but, you know, they didn't do much for LNG or saying we're gonna open up our ports uh, to US LNG, uh, you know, so in some ways you could say, if, even for them, uh, Russia was, an approved preferred supplier. Uh, what, what I hope happens is that 
number one, they diversify their energy. So, you know, they, they do go back, I don't know if they go back to coal, but, you know, reinvest in, uh, reinvest in nuclear, okay? If you don't want to do natural gas and you don't want to do coal, at least go and, you know, reconsider uh, whether you'll have nuclear. Uh, sure, con continue to expand your wind and your solar, uh, but then also look to alternative suppliers for liquefied natural gas, uh, which means you look to the Middle East, you look to the U.S. so that you've got a diversity of supply. Uh, and then, you know, other experts that you talk to, and I know that the Dutch have been trying to lead on this, uh, is, is hydrogen, okay? Is, that's seen by many as a, a real environmentally friendly and clean technology uh, which just hasn't quite reached the point where uh, it can be commercialized. But, you know, the, again, the Dutch have been doing uh, a project in, in Groningen, the northern part of the country, uh, trying to develop a hydrogen hub. They're trying to develop a hydrogen hub uh, around Rotterdam. And so they're, you know, they're, they're aggressively looking for alternatives uh, to this energy dependence uh, on outside uh, outside forces and trying to, you know, rather than it be being a hindrance to them, moving to the point where if they can be the first to develop hydrogen or at the cutting edge, uh, you know, it can be uh, it can be a significant competitive advantage for them. I know uh, certain Southern European countries are less vulnerable because they have gotten. A, a lot less of their gas from Russia. For instance, Spain only got 10% of its of its gas from Russia and was importing a lot uh, from North Africa and Italy, from Azerbaijan, uh, Algeria, uh, so that there are these other sources that make them less directly vulnerable to Russian leverage on this issue. Uh, and therefore, they're they're in a better position to continue to support the NATO position uh, in support of Ukraine, but those other countries aren't. And it, it's uh, it does seem a, a very uh, likely scenario that with a very tough winter in Europe, things are going to start cracking, because, simply because the people will demand that you, you take other care of your own citizens first. Um, apparently, there's a lot of European criticism of Norway now because they have restricted their gas exports because they want to protect their own citizens, which is what governments are supposed to do. Which is what they're, which is what they're supposed to, exactly what. But so, um, you know, that seems to me just the beginning of the fissures that can develop if there's a really tough winter in Europe, which they're, they're very well could be. You know, and yeah, I mean, because, you know, the bottom line is, you know, when you come home in Western Europe, you know, when I, when I went to where we lived in, in Europe, in the Netherlands, or when I come home to my house in Michigan, I expect to be able to turn on the lights, flip the switch, and have the lights come on. I expect to be able to go to my thermostat, and if it's cold outside, uh, to turn it up uh, and to have my house warm. Uh, and I expect to be able to turn the tap on and to get water, right? And those are relatively simple things that we, we've all come to accept. And, you know, if you, uh, and if citizens believe, and, and you do it at affordable prices, and so that, you know, you, uh, you expect that when you, uh, you know, or you, what, what will happen is, yeah, if these things become too expensive um, and those types of things, the citizens are going to get upset. And I, you know, and I can tell the Dutch are already very good at conservation. You know, they're not wasteful. I mean, I think you can describe Americans as being wasteful for energy. We take it for granted, okay? Um, but the Dutch, I think, are very good at conservation. And so, you know, if you tell them to turn the te thermostat down a little bit more keep the lights off or, you know, fewer lights and all of these types of things, they're going to, it's kind of like, whoa, wait a minute, we already do a lot of this. What do you think the potential is in Europe for um, liquefied natural gas? I mean, it, first of all, uh, 
there's really not sufficient capacity there to receive it, is it? They don't no. have the terminals, they, they don't have the regasification plants. Right. So, I mean, there's, uh, I think there's tremendous potential for it, but that is one of the things that will take, you know, years to build out. Okay, these are, it's, it's a very combustible uh, product, so you gotta have a lot of, you know, you gotta build it right, you gotta build it in a secure way. Uh, you got to build the ships to transport it and, and these kinds of things. So yeah, that, that probably is a five or ten year uh, plan, uh, infrastructure plan. But you know, the, th the same thing is we need that infrastructure for LNG. We also need that infrastructure for our electrical grids. Okay, you know, if we're going to have, you know, every other house on a block uh, with an electric car that's going to be charging at night, uh, most most of our electrical grid cannot carry that kind of capacity. So, lots of challenges, lots of opportunities, uh, but it, it's going to require some decisive action, and it's going to take us. It's going to take us in Europe taking a very close look at what's going on right now. I mean, it's it's a it's a great object lesson. Okay, here's what here's what happens. Okay. What do we need to do to prepare so that this doesn't happen in the future? What list those most important steps to be taken? Well, I think it's uh, you got to develop a, a balanced energy portfolio. Um, I like to call the supply chain issue is uh, across a whole range of products, but with energy, we need to have a supply chain. Uh, system in place that there's sufficient supply in freedom-loving countries. All right, so that we're not dependent on, you know, like for lithium, we're not dependent on China. Okay, if we're going to go into battery technology, we got to find supplies where we can get lithium from, uh, you know, secure. It doesn't mean it has to be produced in the United States, but we got to be able to provide it from freedom-loving countries who are reliable. Uh, you know, and then you just got to. Uh, build out the infrastructure to have that flexibility. Uh, electric grids, natural gas grids, uh, a sharing of technology, uh, and a commitment for all of us to move forward. And Europe will move forward in certain areas, the U.S. can move forward in other areas, because uh, you know we always use the, uh, the statement, we all breathe the same air, right? But then we put in place the same standards for the whole world, kind of. We try, okay? China doesn't have to meet the same standards that we do, but, you know, does it really make sense that, you know, Europe maybe ought to lead in one area, which means that, okay, this is, this is what we, sh we should do for their environmental issues. The U.S. is going to lead in other areas. This is going to, our environmental, but overall, you know, what we're doing is we're producing a, a cleaner environment for all of us. Uh, so, you know, some flexibility in place. Well, uh, we, we have discussed Europe and certainly the Netherlands and the United States, <clears throat> but there are world markets for everything we've been talking about. Yep. So the liquefied natural gas is in great demand in Asia, uh, and perhaps more so than in Asia than in Europe, uh, so that the the bidding for it, because the capacity, as you said, to produce it has been fairly limited, uh, has driven the price of that up quite high, which people are willing to pay because they want their lights to go on and their homes to be heated. It doesn't seem to me that these problems can be seen uh, without keeping in mind the, the context of the world markets for these energy these various kinds of energies, it seems the only one that could really make you dependent is is nuclear. I mean, I don't know enough about the potential for hydrogen that you're talking about. Uh, and I, I don't know if the United States is at the cusp of reconsidering uh, nuclear energy, because of course we too have been shutting down our nuclear plants, um, particularly in light of the fact that the technology for building these plants has changed considerably, uh, making them safer, and also being able to build smaller ones that could serve as smaller communities. 
No, that's right. The, um, uh, in, in Michigan, we actually uh, just closed a nuclear plant, and now there's a group that is petitioning uh, you know, for the permitting uh, to reopen the plant, uh, to you know, do the upgrades, the maintenance, and all of that to, uh, to restart the nuclear plant. And I think, uh, you know, like you said, the, the technology has changed dramatically. I don't even know when the, when's the last time we built, built a nuclear plant in the U.S., uh, I don't even know if we have any under, under construction right now. Um, but, you know, this, this, again, this is one of the things that you would think a broad cross-section of the American people uh, ought to be willing to agree on. It's, it's a quote-unquote clean energy. Uh, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not discharging, you know, carbon dioxide or anything like this. Uh, yes, yeah, so you've got to be very, very careful and uh, you know, so you go go down that route, and uh, you, know, and, you know, but it doesn't seem that you know. It, it seems like everything right now, everything is a political fight. You know, there's nothing that people can kind of wrap their hands around and say, okay, uh, you know, let let's do this. And it, it's you know, it's it's not the you know, it's not the single shot problem to resolve it. But if you made a commitment to nuclear, uh, you, know, you would drive down the cost because instead of because all of our nuclear plants are one-off, you know, you build one, and that two years later you you build another one. But it's not like, you know, and you know, what if you had the the core design or whatever and said, okay, we're going to build twenty of these instead of one. The cost goes down. The cost goes down. Probably goes down way down, um, and so it becomes more affordable. And you know, and how much of the how much of our energy does that then produce? It, uh, you know, so well, there, there there are solutions out there. There are solutions. The same consideration of those solutions may or may not be compromised by the severity of the problem. If it gets a lot worse, not so much in the United States because of our supplies. But most particularly in Europe, and what 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 the political forces there would undertake in response to it. The number one thing we've already discussed is, of course, the policy regarding Ukraine and the sanctions uh, against Russia. But then, it if, if it's severe enough, can they overcome their reluctance, even phobia against nuclear power? And fracking and and do what's necessary, or will it be sort of the the socialist solution of restricting supply and rationing uh, through uh, setting prices, which will not simply distribute the misery and not solve the solution, solve the problem yeah. rather. We'll have to wait and see. But you know, at, at 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 the end of the day, citizens have a voice. All right, I I I still remember you know interacting with a, a lot of Dutch folks and, you know, and Europeans, they think different about a lot of these issues than what we do. And the, it always seemed the Dutch were always increasing one tax or another, you know, the tax on road, the tax on gas or, you know, this and, you know, so you know, a couple of times I would say to the, you know, some of the Dutch that I work with and I'd say, you know, they raise, I just read they're raising your tax again. And here in the U.S. that would be a call to arms for the conservative movement, right? Uh, and probably a lot of independents saying, no, you got, you're getting enough. Uh, in the Netherlands, it was too often, I, you know, uh, from my perspective, being a conservative, too often I would hear, well, Pete, you don't understand. They wouldn't be asking or raising our taxes if they didn't need it. That's a different perspective than I've ever had. And it's right. kind of like, oh, okay. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time right now, and I would like to thank our guest, Ambassador Peter Hoekstra, for joining us today to discuss Europe's energy crisis, um, the causes of it, and possible solutions. Uh, I invite our audience to go to the Westminster Institute website to see what other programs we have on offer, including those on the Ukraine-Russia situation, China, uh, China and Taiwan, Japan, and 
various issues in the Middle East. Thank you for joining us. I'm Robert Riley.